Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, for your introduction. Should I need to stand for election again, I guess I have now a very solid uh, campaign manager. Um, I wish to thank the uh, Stanford College leadership for inviting me um, and for allowing me to, to come. I say, that, I say that because uh, there was once when I was uh, Deputy Minister of Higher Education, the student invited me to, to discuss on one of my books. And the Deputy Vice, the, the Vice Chancellor did, did not allow me to, to enter uh, that. And it's a public university. So one of my legacy is perhaps I'm the only Deputy Minister of Higher Education in the whole history of mankind not allowed to enter his own university. <laughs> so I'm honored to be here at Stanford. Thank you. Thank you so much. The topic that is given to me is of utmost importance then and it is also very timely that we discuss this issue. Uh, but I must confess at the outset that I may not be able to provide you uh, concrete answers to such a very important question. Has our education system lost credibility? I believe to a certain extent we have done quite well in certain areas. But as mentioned by Dinesh, there are areas that we are still struggling, like the pizza. This is not pizza. <laughs> Did I see anything wrong? <laughs> uh, the school ranking, I think we have dropped many uh, steps. The university ranking uh, is like a yo-yo to some of our universities. First of all, I must admit that university ranking uh, is not the one and only criteria. There are other ways of looking at university standards. For instance, uh, UITM. The accounting department is probably the best uh, in the country, simply because it's one of the oldest uh, accounting departments. And that is why students get lots of waiver for ACCA papers. And top students of that particular department can continue their final year for the last beginning for uh, the last two years at London School of Economics, for instance, and they get a double degree, one from UITM and one from uh, LSE. The chemistry department uh, of University of Naya is probably one of the most, uh, what do you call, uh, one of the top uh, chemistry department. The Faculty of Arts, a few of us here, uh, come from the Faculty of Arts in UM is probably one of the best uh, in this region. Yeah. Uh, and likewise, if you are comparing uh, some universities in Indonesia, uh, those who are not doing very well in the ranking, but in certain areas, for instance, in technology, Institute Technology Bandung is one of the best in the region. Gajah Mada is one of the best in political science. So if there are many, many ways where we look at uh, the standard or the quality of university education. Because the ranking system sort of decent employment is concerned. I think that is even more important. Are they being, are they getting employed? Are they easily getting employed? Or they find it difficult to uh, or they find it difficult to get employment. And where are they employed? Local companies only? Or are they also able to seek uh, employment in the more established uh, 
global or international companies. So we have to look at it from the greater or from the bigger picture, how our education is doing. And on that score, I think, again, I must admit, we are not really the best, neither are we rock bottom, but perhaps if we put our house in order, we can actually do much better. Yeah. The point is, how do we put our house in order? I think there are a few things that we need to do, and this need not necessarily has been addressed by the blueprint, unfortunately. First and foremost, I think educationists and government must actually ensure that we are very sure what our education goals are about. And to a certain extent, I think the government must put a break to uh, their level of intervention in decision-making processes in as far as education policy is concerned. Let educationists lead uh, policies on education. Yeah. We have to bring back the soul of our education. Uh, are our education is our education system still having that kind of soul that we used to know before? I'm not suggesting that we all become Ghostbusters and start looking. Hi, soul. <laughs> yeah. You see, you you can you can feel as you enter a particular university or as you enter a class. The soul is not seen, but you can feel it. The vibrant of the class. From the way people look at you as you are speaking from the lectern, you can feel. Ah, are they here because it is compulsory or are they here because they want to come here, for instance? Yeah? Are they registering for the course because they are passionate about the study or because their parents asked them to do so? Are they suffering from the three idiots syndrome? I mean, at least one of those guys in the three idiots uh, don't like to be an engineer, but the moment he was born, the father announced to the whole world that he will be the next engineer or the first engineer in the whole uh, clan. Anyone have not seen the three idiots? You better go and watch it. You know? <laughs> it's hilarious uh, and it's a, it's a good social critic. Yeah. I, I, when I was deputy minister, I used to, to say well, one whole Pangong uh, Wayang and invite people. I think about 200 students came and watched it and we had a good time, yeah. Um, you may want to suggest to me what movie you want to watch together and then we can call everybody and watch. I believe Ranja. But good movie lah. Like the, last, the last one that I did was last week. We did on uh, Nelson Mandela's Long Walk uh, to Freedom, yeah. So the soul, how, how do we get back the soul of the university? or education. We have to review and understand the actual meaning of education. That education is not about producing workers, but it's about nurturing men. Yeah. Because you can produce workers but he or she may not, may not necessarily be a good man or a good woman, a good citizen, a good brother, a good sister, a good husband, a good wife, and what have you. But if you were to nature a good man, a good woman, of course, uh, that would include him or her being a good worker. And when we look at uh, policies and education, we must strike a balance between what is national interest and what is family interest. You see, the problem in this country is that the government has taken over the role of the parents in deciding almost everything about the parents' child's or children's future. I don't think that is the right paradigm. I don't think it is the business of the government to take over the role of the parents. 
the role of the government is to make policy that can facilitate the best education system for the children with consultation with the parents. And in this context, I'm talking about the balance between what is national and what is parental. So we must be able to understand the meaning of parental choice. I know, I'm aware of the fact that one of the biggest issues is about vernacular school, uh, the primary school system. We have Chinese school, we have uh, Tamil, um, it's not Chinese or Indian school, it's about Mandarin uh, medium school and Tamil medium school. You see, more often than not, people think this is Sekolah China and this is Sekolah India. No. It is about the medium of instruction, and there is Sekolah Kebangsaan. Yeah. Sometimes in this country, we have to be very cautious of the words that we choose. Muslim and non-Muslim. I try not to use that. I know I'm sinful because I used it before. But I'm aware that there is a better way of saying it. Muslims and people of other faiths. So it's not Chinese and Indian primary school. They're not teaching Chinese culture. They're not teaching Indian culture. They are simply using Mandarin as a medium of instruction and Tamil as a medium of instruction. And Sekolah Kebangsaan is using Bahasa Melayu as a medium of instruction. Yes, of course, I'm aware of the background, the historical background, the legacy of the schools, but you know, if we are talking about unity, then we have to try and work across the differences. The problem is politicians. On the one side, you have Barisan national leaders not wanting to close down the schools. And on the other side, you, also, you have Pakatan Rakyat leaders also not wanting to close down the schools. At the same time, you have scholars and educationists and people asking that probably uh, we should close down these schools and have only one system, the Sekolah Kebangsaan. But if we want to do that, then we have to improve Sekolah Kebangsaan. Because even to some Malays and Muslims, they are no longer sending their kids to Sekolah Kebangsaan, but many are sending to Sekolah Jenis Kebangsaan China, Mandarin uh, medium-run schools. There's one SJKC, Lancha, uh, in Tomorrow, my constituency, my former constituency. There are more Malays than Chinese in that particular SJKC. <laughs> very, very interesting. Yeah. Now, the other way of looking at it is, as I was saying earlier, is about choice. What if the parents choose to send their kids to the SJKC and the SJKT. That is another story. Then. then we have to respect, honor the choices made by the parents. And then people come back and say, but you won't get unity because students are studying in different schools. Now, you ask back this question. Must unity equal uniformity? So if you're not going to close the schools, then you must find ways how you interact among uh, peoples of those schools. So you have to be creative in order for you to find ways to get students from different schools to interact among each other. Now, the other thing that is of utmost importance, I think, is we have to look at the curriculum I know the blueprint addresses the issue of the curriculum. It's one of the 11 uh, strategic uh, areas of concern. But I must admit, I think uh, we have to do more than what has been addressed in the curriculum, uh, in the blueprint. And I'm uh, uh, referring to a more balanced, a more holistic approach to education where the curriculum and the co-curriculum, uh, the, the, 
the composition between or the components, the composition between what is known as curriculum and what is known as co-curriculum uh, is more balanced. I have been advocating the idea of a 70-30 kind of balance where uh, academic is about 70% and the other 30% is about co-curriculum. At the university level, I think the, the ministry during my time, we have introduced the GSA, the Generic Student Attributes, uh, to ensure that the extracurricular activities are given due recognition by universities, by lecturers and students. But unfortunately, I think in some universities, they have taken, or rather they, they approach that co-curriculum part like it is an academic work. So it's over, uh, they even have some kind of exam, uh, to, you know, and, and so it's, it's, it's not uh, uh, being implemented uh, uh, as it was uh, planned uh, initially. So I've asked my colleagues, I said, look, you really have to review this. Uh, some universities are uh, overzealous in measuring everything to the extent that, uh, you know, they want to know how many hours you spend you know, doing this, doing that. You know. uh, I'm not sure if they ask you, are you dating, are you clubbing, or something like that. I hope they don't. So, my friends, nowadays, I, I told myself, if I were to go back to university, I'm going to fail. <laughs> Gone are the days where we can mark. You know what is mugging? You know mugging? They don't know mugging. <laughs> when I was in the UM, uh, it was the term system. I, I was a history major student, single major. Uh, you take 10 subjects a year, so three years. I took uh, 10 in the first, second, and the third year. Uh, I, I successfully failed uh, one subject every year. Uh, and, <laughs> and, and, uh, and I don't have to receive, I don't have to repeat. Because we don't have a CGPA system where you have to carry marks. Yeah? So every year you got your points and you know that you qualify to go to the next year. So by the second year, I know I have qualified for my honours. So I can even fail one subject in the final year and still get my honours. Definitely not first class. Lah. If I got first class honours, then I'd probably become your professor. But I was not a stupid politician. Lah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, mugging means you study, you burn the midnight candle uh, because tomorrow is exam law, uh, that's basically. So I spent one year as a first year student, so was it in the second year and the third year, and in all honesty, I study only two weeks for every year. Mugging. <laughs> what do I do with the, the rest 50 weeks? <laughs> Search me. <laughs> I was, a, I was a teacher. I was a part-time teacher when I was in the first and the second year. I think I was a full-time teacher when I was in the final year and a part-time student. <laughs> you know. uh, oh, there are all kinds of tricks that we do. Lah. So if your lecturer tells you study hard, ask back, did you do like that when you were a student? Ah. <laughs> no, but the system has changed. You have um, you know, a system that is, you know, a um, semester system that is more structured. But in actual fact, in actual fact, the semester system uh, is aimed at assisting, especially the, uh, the students who are, how do I say, uh, the, the slower students. Yeah. The slower learner, actually. Actually, the semester system helps. Because can you imagine, and I've seen some of my friends who didn't, did, who, didn't who failed subjects at the end of the year. Can you imagine, you study for one whole year, and it takes only a three hour exam at the end of the year to decide whether you fail or pass. Yeah. Of course, we have our carry marks from our assignments and tutorial participation, but uh, it's not like, I mean, my daughter, I thought uh, the way she's, yes, of course, uh, she cannot enjoy life like I was uh, 
enjoying life when I was on campus. But but I thought uh, exam is not a torture for her because uh, by the time she sits for her exams in each of the semesters, uh, it is only like another what thirty thirty percent uh, or sometimes twenty percent of the whole course because uh, many have been uh, many uh, assignments and uh, whatnot uh, have been uh, taken into account. So. <clears throat> We have to look at this uh, uh, balance yeah, between what is known as classroom and what is known as uh, activities outside the classroom. Now, my one, uh, one, one last point that I want to share with you before we go to the uh, Q&A is about student activism. Yeah. Um, I'm an advocate of student activism. I, I was a student activist. I was president of the uh, Persatuan Bahasa Melayu University Melaya. But mind you, it is not just uh, a language association. It is actually a very strong student movement. Uh, it is the rival to the student union. Yeah. And during my time, it is not the memberships are not only Malay students. Uh, I, I was met, I, I met the, the current committee of the Persatuan Bahasa Melayu uh, yesterday, and uh, <clears throat> my first comment was, "How come small Melayu? How come all Malays are uh, in this meeting?" Because during our time, it's not Persatuan Melayu, it's not a Malay association, it's a Malay language, it's a national language association, so it belongs to all students, and. As much as we were fighting for uh, the usage of Malay language as the official language and medium of instruction and so on and so forth, but we were also fighting for students' welfare. Uh, and at times we were also uh, uh, discussing uh, about uh, national issues. And national issues include uh, political issues. Some of us get into trouble, but we know how to navigate and we survive. Now, I think it is very important that students practice what I used to say, and I am still a believer of empowerment. Students are given the space, or students pursue to look at the space, or to secure the space, where, to a certain extent, you are enabled to think and act on your own and be able to speak up uh, on issues issues pertaining to your domestic uh, concern as of in university or in campus issues concerning your family your surroundings your environment your your country you have all the right to, to speak up on these issues. Even though I was in the ministry for four years, but among others, I managed to amend section 15 of the UUCA, of the University uh, and College Act, which before this forbids students from being involved in politics, but now you have, we have allowed students to be involved in politics. And in the last GE, that was the first GE of the so long where students can actually participate in the general election, either as a worker, as a lobbyist, as a promoter, or agent, or whatever. In fact, they can even stand for election, uh, but no one stands for election. We don't expect them to stand for election anyway. <clears throat> but they were free uh, to move around. And uh, to a certain extent, uh, this was due to some bold and brave student activists who took charge of their own political space uh, before the last thing the UKM fought. Uh, Hillman, uh, King Chai, and the other two, I always forgot uh, the name of them, and the other two guys. Yeah. Hillman is now in PKR. King Chai has just completed, completed his uh, master's in the UK. He was a Chevening scholar, about to come back. 
Uh, the other two, one of them uh, is also pursuing his uh, master's in, I think, UM or UKM. The other one, a lady, I'm told, is working and is also pursuing her master's. So they're doing well. So they defund the myth that student activists fail in exams or something like that. Yeah. Okay, now I can go on and on and on. Uh, and uh, but I believe uh, we don't like monologues. Uh, dialogues uh, are to be promoted, especially in Malaysia in today's uh, situation. So if I may then uh, end here and invite uh, questions from the floor, I will be very happy to try and answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Dato, for your speech. So right now, the floor is open for a Q&A session. You have 20 minutes of time. Please be precise with your question. And please introduce yourself before asking the question. So we shall give it to the first question right now. You can ask anything. Lah, yeah? Not necessarily limiting your questions to whatever that I was trying to articulate. Yes, Hello, uh, good afternoon, Dr. Uh, my question is about the Chinese Independent School. Uh, I have students sitting for the Chinese Independent School exams and also the local exams. They can get A in local exams. When it comes to Chinese Independent School, they get C and D. So, um, like subjects like science and math and so on. So, are we setting our standard very low? Or are we very interested in creating a uh, quantity, high quantity of A students? rather than looking at the quality. Uh, that's my question. Thank you, Nato. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not very familiar with the nitty-gritty and detail of the results of the uh, papers set by students from different high schools. Uh, if it is true that there is a gap then probably this is something that we have to look at, yeah. But since you mentioned the private uh, Chinese high school, uh, how many of you are from private Chinese high school? Okay. Uh, first of all, there are not so many of them. There are about 60, and one or two is about to be uh, established. Including, including the one in Kuantan. Uh, there is a bigger issue uh, than that. It is about recognition of the UEC, the United Education Certificate. Yeah. The problem is the government have not recognized the UEC. And because of that, students with UEC cannot study in public universities they may be able to get enrollment in private universities. And many of them choose to study overseas, like in Singapore, there are many of them, I met many of them, in China, in uh, Taiwan, in the US, in the UK, Australia, New Zealand. And some are very, very good students. And that adds to our Brain drain actually, because when they study overseas, some choose not to come back and they choose to work where they are studying. The problem is, as I said earlier, the government is not recognizing them. Uh, the promoters of the school, Don Jong, have been trying very hard to get the government to uh, recognize them. Uh, political parties like MCA and Gerakan, I'm talking about the BN political parties, have tried their level best to convince uh, AMNO leadership that the government should recognize, but so far to no avail. Uh, until just before GE13, the Prime Minister invited uh, Mr. Tan, the President of uh, UNIS, uh, uh, Don to his office, and uh, there was some positive sign that the government uh, would eventually recognize, but unfortunately, nothing happened. 
I have always been saying that we should recognize the UEC. Uh, should there be any differences or any gap in certain areas like the Malay language syllabus, then we must find ways and means to address it. This is not politics. This is about the future of the children. Uh, maybe 20, 30 years ago, we were at loggerheads, Dongjong and Amno, but you are talking about the kids, for God's sake. Yeah? And they have to go and study far, far away from their own country. And this is everybody's country. Nobody's going back to China or India or, in my case, to Sumatra. <laughs> <laughs> this is our land and we, 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 we were born here and we will uh, die here, inshallah. Yeah. So, rather than going on the political uh, approach, we should really look at it from the educational uh, point of view. Uh, and we have done this before. Two scholar, menengah agama rakyat. At one time, they were using a curriculum that was not necessarily um, uh, following the national curriculum. But because we chose to recognize uh, Sekolah Melengah Agama and Sijil Agama, uh, we actually sat down, spent a couple of years. It's not easy because you're talking about generation, you're talking about people in school, people coming in. But finally, we did it. So the same process should be taken in addressing the UEC issue. But I hope this will, this will take place, I hope. Uh, I don't know when. Uh, but I really, I'm hopeful that, that we should be able to uh, address this issue. Thank you, sir. Can I have the next question, please? Yes, the guy. Hello, um, good afternoon, Dato. My name is Shashi, I'm from the School of Media Studies. My question School is of? Media Studies. Okay. My question is In which area do you think our Malaysian education system has improved from when you were studying? From the time when I was studying. Oh, okay. No, that is a more difficult question. <laughs> you should have given me a hit on before I came. <laughs> Okay, I can think of one or two. Uh, I think we have done well, we have done quite well, or perhaps very well, in as far as access to education is concerned. Yeah. Access to education. Uh, and also striking a balance uh, in certain areas, uh, especially in the so-called professional areas, where at one time uh, certain community were starkly uh, missing from the classes for various reasons. I think we have managed to strike the balance. What we have not done well is I think compared to some of our uh, competitors in the region, there was a time when we were probably better than them and now we, we are probably, you know, have to catch up. You know, in particular, Singapore, Indonesia and Thailand. Take proficiency of English as an example. Yeah. And this is an example that I gather uh, from diplomats and retired diplomats, including my boss, Ansir Azali Ismail, former president of the UN General Assembly. And of course, from my own, uh, my little experience as a consultant with the UN uh, office in Bangkok many, many years ago. You know, there was a time when uh, every time the UN system formed a committee and the committee is entrusted to come up with a communique or with a resolution, they will always be running after the Malaysian diplomats. Hey, Mr. So and so, hey, Ambassador, Your Excellency, uh, can you be in this committee? Oh, but I'm already attached to another committee. Can you send your colleague to be in the committee? It's like no committee can operate, I mean, at least in the Asia and the Pacific, without Malaysian diplomats on board. Why? Because the Malaysian diplomats would eventually become the English <laughs> writer or 
uh, 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 proofreader or you know, but in in many ways will influence. It's not about the, it's not only about the English, yeah. Will influence the content of the communicate or resolution. It's not happening today anymore uh, because you have abundance of diplomats from other countries in the region, in particular Indonesia and Thailand. And of course Singapore uh, has always been there. So in certain areas, I think uh, we have you know, uh, we have not done well, but probably we have done, unfortunately, worse. Yeah? The other way of looking at it is, I think, uh, on scholarly works. There was a time when our professors were renowned, were, were considered uh, the scholars in his or her field of studies. If not reaching the world standard, but definitely at the Asian level or Asia and the Pacific level. Uh, I'm very glad that Dinesh uh, quoted my Sifu, Professor Kuke King. I think he is absolutely right in his observation. You know? uh, yes, I was saying the past faculty of the UM is still probably one of the best, but uh, I think we were better uh, last time. You, know? you can see this very clearly from uh, literatures published by scholars from other countries. Mm -hmm. To what extent are they citing our professors? Work? This, is, this is the real way of looking at scholarship. I was a uh, few nights ago at a forum at KL Selangor uh, Chinese Assembly Hall. Uh, it was in conjunction with a book launch, the, uh, a book on, uh, the, the title of the book is Critical Dynamics of uh, our GE 13 election, GE, yeah, the last election by Meredith Wiss. Yeah. And I met Kessler, a great professor from Australia, and a few others. And not that uh, I don't like uh, Australians or Americans writing on Malaysian politics. They are most welcome. Anyone can write on our politics. In fact, sometimes it's better than outsiders write because they give you a, a more fair uh, assessment of what is happening. But how I wish more of our professors would be writing and publishing uh, and get you know, that kind of uh, attention by other scholars from other universities. So this is the way I, I look at it. Some areas I think we are doing well, but in certain areas, I know it's very difficult to actually quantify uh, in numbers, because sometimes it is really difficult to quantify things like education in numbers. But besides what I was saying, I think uh, the PISA rating, university ranking, though not necessarily the best way of looking at it, show you certain level of achievement and certain level of unachievement if there is such a level. Thank you. Next. something to ask regarding the National Education Blueprint. The first one was introduced in 2006. So, correct me if I'm wrong, the main objective of it to improve our education system. The thing is, in your point of view, what has the first blueprint failed that the government need to introduce the second one? And how sure is the government that the second one will be successful? That's my question to you. Okay, thank you. I think the first one you are referring to the one done by Musa, the former Minister of Education. He was the former Vice Chancellor of USM. I think it is 2006 yes. that was during his time. And the second one is the one that was launched uh, very, very recently. Uh, the blueprint, which have, which, uh, among, I mean, which have 11 uh, areas or 11 steps uh, forward. Let, let me put it this way. Um, 
the main difference would be uh, the 2006 was done uh, mainly by the Ministry of Education. The second blueprint was done by the Ministry of Education in consultation with all the other stakeholders. They organized a series of town hall meetings around the country and I think about 25,000 parents and teachers, sorry, uh, parents and uh, yeah, teachers and others were there. And we pay some million uh, of dollars to Matt Tingsy. <laughs> a consulting firm, which I don't think we need to do that. You know? We have enough professors and scholars in the country to advise the ministry. So that will be the first uh, main difference. But to be, to be fair to the blueprint, they do come up with some progressive uh, suggestions, like more autonomy to the Pajabat Pelajaran Daerah, the district education uh, department, though some uh, still debate whether in the first place you need a uh, district department office because the originality of the office was suspect. Was it really to help in administration of schools or to allow people to get promotion? There's not enough headmasters to get people promotion, so you create another monster. <laughs> okay, so I don't know. Uh, the other thing that is good is that schools are given more autonomy. But again, uh, to what extent are we implementing the autonomy of schools? How autonomous are school principals or HMs as we call it those days? Yeah. They have introduced a couple of the art way of doing uh, classes, but unfortunately it was implemented uh, at a time when the schools and teachers are not necessarily well prepared. I give an example, the PBS, Pentaksiran Berasaskan Sekolah. How do you translate that into English? School-based assessment. I'm told that uh, the experts, our experts were looking, I mean, this is the way to improve teaching and learning in class. Because uh, the main complaint is that our classes are, you know, just about rock learning, teacher talking, student listening, and then you have to memorize, and then you, you bring it out again during the exam, and that's it. You know? uh, the moment you 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 put the last uh, dot, uh, full stop for the last answer, and that's it. Everything yeah. forgot already, <laughs> and you and you shout my <laughs> and then you go. You go, you go for your tetare and whatnot, you know. Uh, where was I? <laughs> so the expert was saying now we have to improve the teaching and learning techniques uh, in class. And one of the ways is to get, uh, to make our classes, to make our system less exam oriented. So because of that, this year's form 3 is the first batch, not having to sit for PMR and so on. And the PBS is also to allow teachers autonomy, where teachers can actually teach students according to the student uh, the, the students uh, pace. I mean, basically that's what it is. The problem <coughs> is students' mark for every subject have to be submitted online. The problem is the internet access is very poor. Teachers are complaining to me that they have to stay up until late in the night or early morning when the internet access would be better or to wake up very early in the morning to uh, submit the marks uh, into the system. And the system, I'm told, is very slow and sometimes not easily accessible, even when uh, the internet is running well. I'm, I'm aware of a grouping of, of teachers who are now anti-PBS. Uh, there's a Facebook, there's a hashtag on Twitter on anti-PBS. They, they wanted to see me, like, I mean, I think we got, to, we got to, to give them a listening ear, yeah, words to teachers. I do this 
many times. I get into trouble also sometimes, no problem. It's good to be in trouble. <laughs> uh, positive trouble is okay. <laughs> no, no, I think we, we need to listen to them. I, I was listening to my teachers when I was the MP for Tumulo. We spent three hours trying, I, I spent three hours trying to understand the PBS system. And I know some, some couples, uh, you know, have problems. Can you imagine if you are the husband and you're not a teacher and your wife is a teacher and she has to stay up at night? on the computer, you can be suspicious. <laughs> hey, sayang, what are you doing? It's 3 o'clock in the morning and it's malam Jumat. <laughs> yeah. So there are issues there. There are issues. And I think we need to really... You see, the problem is sometimes, sometimes, though our intentions are noble, yeah, but perhaps, uh, the way we do it may not necessarily uh, in sync with uh, current situation or uh, the places where we are uh, teaching. I'll give you an example. Uh, I'm told also, for instance, that set the, the, the new the, the PBS system, teachers are to come up with evidence on their own. Uh, for, for, the, for young teachers who just graduated and while they were in college doing education, and teaching, they were taught the old system. Now they are in school having to teach with a new system. They are uh, almost uh, in the dark. And for the older generation who are about to retire, you know, having to learn a new system, and some of them are not that IT savvy. Now that can also be troublesome. So we, and again, uh, my some of my friends who are teachers, they are telling me, Dean. PBS, I'm told, is borrowed among others from Australia, where the enrollment per class is like 15, and the moment it is 16, the parent will be shouting, <laughs> why, am, why is my kid in a class of 16? Tell me how many of you from Malaysia who had a class of 20 or less? So, Creating evidences for student population of more than 30, sometimes more than 40, is quite a headache for teachers uh, having to, to, to teach using the new system. They are not complaining, uh, but all they are trying to say is please listen to our grievances and then can the government not provide them with teacher assistance? After all, I have thousands of students coming from university not yet working with teaching education, uh, with education uh, diplomas and degrees. Uh, teachers have been asking for additional clerks uh, in school. You know, one of my former teacher, Zavira, uh, she's a principal in one of the school in Kuala Lumpur, texted me one day and told me, Dean, do you know that? The teachers are complaining not because of classwork. They are teachers, they are passionate, most of them at least, they are passionate teachers, they are committed to their to their cause, to their work. But the complaint is there are six there are six and she texts me, my poor teacher texts me, sixty-four, a list of sixty-four non-teaching and learning related work that a teacher normally have to carry out in school. Plus number 65, uh, depending on arahan, that is masa to masa. <laughs> so but, but basically 64. Uh, most teachers, trust me, if you were to see them, they will not complain about actual teaching load. The complaint will be the non-teaching related load. And I think we really have to, we really have to look at this. We, we tried in the past and I think we have to do more in order for us to facilitate uh, the teachers in schools uh, so that they can actually focus uh, on real teaching you know, rather than uh, doing the... I'm not saying, I'm not saying the other 60, uh, 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 64 works are not important. They are important, but perhaps others can do that and let the teachers do real teaching. Yes, please.
Good afternoon, Dato. Coming back to the PBS system, or what we call as the new curriculum, KSSR. Mm. Um, I think the idea is excellent, but there's a lot of problem with implementation. Because I myself, when I speak to the school teacher, they're not able to give a thorough assessment of the children. And imagine if you have a student of 20, 40 students in a class, and you know, collecting evidences from all the 40 students in a class is actually you know, a lot of work for the, for the staff, for the, for the teacher. So what has our government, or what are they doing about it? Because the school teachers are themselves are very not, they're not so sure about the assessment, you know, how it works. And it keeps changing every year, you know. And apparently, children from Standard 1 itself, they carry a big, thick file that's supposed to be carried up to Standard 6. And that file should consist or contain of all the evidences of all the work that they have done in class. And how can one, one teacher handle all that? So that actually, you know, there's a lot of impact on the quality of teaching as well, if you ask me. If, it's, if there's a problem with implementation. Of course, the idea is excellent, the philosophy is excellent, everything about it is excellent. But when it comes to implementation, there's a lot of problems with it. Because I am self as a mother, and when I, I go and speak to teachers uh, during the school, uh, the report card day, whatever not, you know, they're not so sure in explaining back to me how are the children or the students progressing. And plus, there's no grades. It's all banding system. It's band 1 to band 6. And apparently, and ask her, you know, so how do you actually evaluate this banding system? Apparently, if the student is able to give a speech without any mistakes, and they achieve a very high band. <laughs> but if they can't, then they're on the average band. So when I see a mark, a test paper, from usual 90, par 90 plus or 80 plus, now it's like I look at it, B3, B4, and I ask her back, so what does it mean? So they're not able to interpret, interpret the meaning of those band system to us, to parents properly. So I'm very disappointed with that actually because those days, you know, teachers used to say, okay, you see marks there, 90 plus you did well, 50 plus you didn't do well, 40 plus you failed, whatever not. But with the banding system, I think it's quite difficult to interpret or digest um, the evaluation of, of the students in class. So what is your view on this, sir? Thank you. Thank you. And to add to the problem, some some schools resorted to having some kind of exam at the end of the year. <laughs> Ultimately, because they say, how how do I how do I stream students in different classes? You know, that 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 add to the confusion. Well, I I must I must admit I don't have the answer, but <laughs> I was reminding my officer because I got this note from uh, this group of teachers. Uh, they, they wanted they, they want to, to, to have a meeting. I think I will be meeting them uh, as soon as possible. Um, I already have another one that is still not soft. Uh, uh, graduates from private universities majoring in education. Uh, they are not given, uh, I thought, I think they are not given a fair uh, chance of getting, uh, of, of securing teaching uh, employment in governmental schools. There are thousands of them. Uh, you know, sometimes it is interesting that you get into contact with people through this kind of dialogues and through the social media. Uh, I remember one classic example is uh, suddenly one day, what, two years ago, someone uh, in the Twitter who calls himself Raman Chomot tweeted me and said, uh, that you know of the problems of thousands of, of graduates who are not getting job and they are teaching graduates. And I said, please come and see me and we met at parliament and he was giving me a list of 10,000 students not getting um, interview. Yeah. And job is another story. Uh, not uh, invited for the interview and I say, wow, this is a big number. And then I, I gather that there were about uh, 2,000 odd uh, DPLI, whatever, uh, not confirmed in service. Up to my minister, and in the meeting, in one of the meetings with our officers, so the minister asked, uh, Can you please uh, uh, enlighten us how many graduates uh, from teaching faculties or education faculties from public universities are still not working or not? invited for interviews and uh, uh, a standard answer is we will check it for you sir 
Yes, Next week, they came up with something like 2,500. And I saw my minister, Khalid Modem. He was like, the deputy minister has got a list of 10,000 people, and you're telling me it's 2,500. So sometimes you really have to go down and get the real numbers, the real things that is happening on the ground. Then we decided to put up a paper to cabinet, uh, an urgent matter, and then the cabinet approved uh, 10 new, 10,000 new postings for teachers. After that, I got some more uh, messages. What about the private stu uh, students in private universities? Uh, we met them, now we are trying to. So you have just added another story. <laughs> no, no, I, I know about this issue. We are, we are working on it. I'm meeting them uh, very soon. We, we have to facilitate uh, these issues. But yes, I think uh, the government is working hard, but at the same time, uh, sometimes information don't get through to the ministers and prime minister, so we need people to, uh, you know, ferry or to pass and deliver messages. And some people just have to do it, uh, either on his own or her own or with others. But we just get, we must try and address these issues. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I see one, I see two. Okay, okay. Yeah. 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 Now that we have a few of hands, can we just uh, collect? The questions, like three questions first, and then, yeah. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Priscilla. Um, my question is, what is your point of view on the fact that public universities are offering courses which are not accredited by professional bodies and MQA? Thank you. Okay, can I have the second question? Hi, Dato. My question is slightly out of topic, but from my opinion, I think it's an education problem because I think from our government sectors, most of the staffs, they couldn't speak much English <laughs> because I know our Bahasa Kebangsaan is Bahasa Melayu, but still when foreigners are coming in our country, when they can't communicate well with our government sector staffs, from your opinion, you think is it an uh, education system problem? With English. Thank you. Thank you. I saw another hand. Yes, sister. I'll take this three first. Uh, good afternoon, Dato. My name is Selby. I'm one of the lecturers in Stanford. Okay, my question is that currently there is, I mean, there's a data sh showed that our graduates who are unemployed in Malaysia approximately 400,000, no? including government and also private sectors. So, do you think is it like something wrong with our method of delivering the lesson, for example, like, should we mo make it more like assignment basis rather than focusing on three hours lecture a day in a class? And if in case like you, maybe like, there is a question, no, the data is not correct, I mean, it's not valid, and why there is a lot of job, I mean, exhibition, you know, we end doing job exhibition in Valley, a lot of job, job exhibition, but at the end of the day, our graduate un unable to get a job. And Maybe your point of view, is it like something wrong with the way we are conducting the, 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 the lesson? Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, in exam we don't have to answer all questions. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick now. Because <laughs> the questions were getting more difficult. <laughs> uh, okay, public universities and courses that are not accredited by MQA and professional bodies. There are two ways of looking at it. Uh, perhaps there are real cases where the courses offered are not uh, fully accredited. And I'm not very sure. I, I believe that is probably uh, not really true. What can happen is this. There are cases where uh, a pub not only public university, even private universities are allowed to start a new subject, or, sorry, a new course pending MQA accreditation. The reason is this. A newly established college, private. Yeah. Uh, we understand the practicality of it. You offer certain courses, 
uh, it takes time for NQA to give you full accreditation. So the ministry will say, by all means, start the course, have a certain ceiling of intake, make sure certain criteria are fulfilled. At the same time, you apply for the NQA. And more often than not, before the course mature, and by maturity here means the full uh, uh, course, like the final year. Before the final year were to sit for their exam, you would be able to get the NQA. But there are instances, even public universities don't get uh, NQA, and then they get into trouble. <coughs> Second is, some professional courses also Require professional bodies uh, accreditation like accounting, law, medicine, uh, architecture, and so on, including uh, what you call uh, nursing, including nursing. There are 13 uh, professional studies uh, that need some kind of professional accreditation. I know one university, one public university, uh, offered law. This is in the East Coast. Offered law. Uh, and, bef and and they got the MQA accreditation in the third or in the fourth year, so just in time before the first batch of law students graduate. But for at least four or five years, or meaning batch of students, they didn't get bar council recognition. So those students were in deep trouble. Yeah. The only way for them to do it is, I don't know, they have to I really don't know how, how they will get right yeah, to get accreditation. Meaning to say they cannot practice uh, as an advocate uh, or solicitor. Or in our context, as a lawyer. Like Malaysia says you can be an advocate and solicitor at the same time. But I have a bigger problem, which I did not manage to solve uh, during my time in, in the ministry. Many of the lecturers teaching uh, professional subjects, uh, though they probably have masters and PhDs, more often than not they have PhDs, in the field of study that they are teaching, but they are not full-fledged professional themselves. Uh, there are less than 20%, at least until uh, two years ago, less than 20% of our accounting lecturers in public universities are themselves CA, Chartered Accountant. Uh, less than 40% of our engineering lecturers, especially civil engineering, yeah, because electrical, and they may not need that, that kind of uh, accreditation, or they, they are not considered, uh, they don't really have to be an IR. But many of our civil engineering uh, professors, though they have PhDs and they are professors, and rightfully they are, but uh, on the professional side, they are not IRs. And many of our lecturers in architecture are not IRs, and so on and so forth. So we were, at one, on the one hand, the ministry were asking all of our lecturers to do their PhDs, blah, 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 blah. What we should have done was, yes, you, should, you are encouraged to do your PhD, but at the same time, you should also fulfill your professional uh, you know, career uh, as such that you should be, if you're an engineer, you'll be an IR. It would, I mean, it, it would, and, and that is probably the reason why uh, coming to the uh, employment story, why is it that some of our graduates don't actually get the kind of job that they so desire, especially based on what they were studying? So imagine, for instance, if you are a graduate in accounting in a public university taught by 90% lecturers who are not CAs, uh, the approach to the class would definitely be different if your teachers are 90% CAs, uh, chartered accountants. Worse if the faculty is situated somewhere in Luar Banda because if you are in the town area, then there is a possibility because faculty normally will invite professionals to come and teach. Yeah. So even if majority of your teachers are not chartered accountant, but you get chartered accountant to come and teach. The same thing goes to law and engineering, especially law. Yeah. 
So you have evening classes where professionals come and teach. But if you are somewhere in Rompin, if you are somewhere in Sinto, then it is very difficult to get professionals to come and teach. And I don't have the numbers, but I have this hunch that sometimes probably because the market uh, whispers and then they will say, oh, you're getting accounting student? Okay, where are you from? Uh -huh, the university. Uh, and then should the, the guy who interview you ask you this question, uh, or oh, you do accounting, where? Oh, somewhere, there. Uh, okay. Uh, 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 do you get uh, accountants to come and teach you? Oh, hardly, sir. Then, if I were to be the guy who's your prospective employer, then I will, I will, I will have this funny feeling that hmm, this guy seems to be bright, but I don't think he is well trained, such that I, I should employ him. Not that I don't like him, not that I don't like the school, but look, I have to be cost efficient. So probably these are the dynamics that is happening, and these are the things that you were trying to address. I hope my colleagues are, 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 are addressing the issue and I, I'm thankful that you asked. At least I have a reason to call and ask, hey guys, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. Oh, I think the English part, perhaps uh, to a certain extent, though I may not agree to say, I, I won't say that it could be, uh, it is uh, the major uh, uh, reason, but because you ask about officers, but if it is headmasters and principals, it is a problem. Yeah. And I know that a big number of headmasters in primary schools and principals in secondary schools do not speak good English. Or rather, they cannot sentence without assistance. That's the way now they look at it. Yeah. Uh, when I was uh, an MP, I asked my PPD, uh, district education officer, I said, look, we have 60 schools, 10 of them are secondary schools, I'm, please tell me uh, what is the standard of English of our 10 principals and, uh, sorry, more, more, uh, 60 primary schools and 20 uh, secondary schools, so there are 80 schools, please tell me uh, how good is uh, our school leadership's English and the answer was not positive at all, not positive. So uh, leadership is important in education. I mean, uh, if the headmaster were to speak English during assemblies, good English in particular, that would you know give the kind of message to both teachers and students. Yeah, but if the headmaster are not the headmasters are not able to do it, then it gives a different kind of message. Okay, cool. all edu all questions on education. Uh -huh. Very easy. <laughs> Anything outside education? Uh -huh. It's okay lah. Don't worry. You won't be penalized. You have about what? Dinesh, five more minutes. Or more. Okay, the time is up. But any burning last questions? You cannot sleep if you don't. You have the burning one. Don't burn me, okay? <laughs> okay, sir. I don't want a diplomatic answer from you. I want it to be very honest. Do you think our education system lost credibility? And do you think that the government can improve our education system to achieve the goal of Vision 2020? That's all. I think we have not lost credibility, but we could have done better. If only we trust our scholars and our educationists more and politicians play less role in making decisions. The problem is the reverse is happening. Yeah. Was that diplomatic or what? <laughs> <laughs> okay guys, uh, should anyone have any other questions or queries? My Twitter handle is ABD. And my handphone is zero one nine three three seven four one seven one. Ah, you don't believe me? Ah, try me lah. <laughs> Scale one, you know. Uh, I I I treat myself. Uh, I don't have I don't have an admin to do it. So you won't get 
uh, my you don't see me tweeting as I am talking because that's almost impossible. <laughs> like some people do. Wow, I'm talking too. How can you be tweeting while you're talking? <laughs> Unless you are very good and very savvy. Anyway, yeah, 019 okay. I would prefer SMS. But please, yeah, don't in the middle of the night. <laughs> Suddenly you tweet me, good night, Dato. <laughs> and then you put a smiley somewhere. And you don't know it could be my wife who look at the phone. Then you are starting the Third World War. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you. Uh, thank you. Okay.